was Jesus, really? Was he a spiritual leader, an unfortunate martyr? Was he an outlaw and a revolutionary? I grew up going to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and Wednesday night. Like I can't even tell you how many collective hours I stood and sang songs of worship in all kinds of different venues and settings. I was a part of a student ministry growing up where I was so blessed to have several adults speaking into my faith at an age when I was trying to figure out who I was and what I was supposed to be doing or what path that I wanted to follow. I went to summer camps every summer and to CIY MOVE conferences, the same conferences our high schoolers here at White Oak go to right now. I served with this woman named Karen Smith, and I helped her lead Bible lessons for kindergartners at our church. Now, I shared those things because I have to admit that I was left with an important question in my young faith unanswered. How did I view Jesus? Who was this Jesus that I claimed to follow? Now there have been, over the years, scholars who have attempted to figure out like, what Jesus may have actually looked like. After all, he is the most depicted figure in the history of Western art. His likeness is seen everywhere. People even claim to see the image of Jesus on toast. Can you see it right now? It's there, all right? We've seen this very popular European-looking Jesus from the fourth century. And a lot of our images of Jesus come from, from that era. Here's one, and this depicts Jesus in the likeness of, of Zeus or, or Augustus Caesar. And you can see that Jesus is enthroned in glory over all the world. Now these scholars say that most men in the Greco-Roman world were clean shaven with short hair. Even Jewish men themselves in ancient times were rarely depicted or talked about having long beards or, or long hair. Also, Jewish men didn't wear long flowing robes. Men would have worn shorter tunics that came just down to the knees. They may have worn a, like a cloth over their shoulder called a mantle to serve them in, in colder weather. Only the wealthy or royalty wore any colors due to the expensive nature of dyes. So men like Jesus, they would have worn just a typical off-white color of wool tunic. In 2001, a forensic anthropologist named Richard Nave created a model of a Galilean man for a BBC documentary, working on the basis of an actual skull found in the region where Jesus grew up. Here's what he believes Jesus could have looked like. So who is Jesus, really? Like, what did he teach? What did he invite us to follow? Now, I think a lot of us share those questions. And maybe, whether you've grown up in, in faith or not, you've asked them since you were young. Because we don't want to base our trust and obedience to God, or a lack of it, off an incorrect view of Jesus. We don't want to search or discover a Jesus that, that never even existed. In our modern culture, we hate the idea of being misled, of fake news or misinformation, of censored information or fake people. And I get it, I hate that too. So if you're gonna take one step further down the path of faith, you need to know who it is that you're following and where he promises to lead you. You and I want to know the real Jesus. Well, Matthew, one of Jesus' friends and disciples, he writes about Jesus' first recorded teaching moment. And this is what he says. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. So Jesus launches into what turns out to be a lengthy sermon on that hillside that day about all kinds of religious do's and don'ts, or so it seems. So let's take a look and we'll pick it up in verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, 
that's pretty ominous. If I'm listening to Jesus say that, I want to make sure that my religion is pretty salty and flavorful, or else I'm going to end up in a bad place. But then he goes on in verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So Jesus is saying now that, that my outer life should be so good that when other people see it, they recognize the characteristics of God himself in me. Now talk about a little bit of pressure there. But he goes on still, verse 20. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. To that, I would say, wait a minute. If my life doesn't reflect the faith and the purity and integrity, and that my life is better than mo the most religious people I know, if that's not the case, then I may not get into heaven. See, when I experience Jesus' words, I'm a bit in shock. And suddenly I lose the image of, of that thoughtful Jesus that was just kind of gazing at me or gazing up into heaven. And instead, it's replaced by a vision of this hard-faced like, school teacher Jesus, who's like slapping a, a ruler in his hand, walking the aisles of the classroom, while I'm sweating over a test that I find myself quite unprepared for. So what was Jesus setting us up for? Like, what did he expect from those who would put their trust in him? It sounds to me that, that I don't have much of a prayer to end, to end up measuring up to the standards he set. So what we come to discover about the real Jesus today is this right here. What Jesus thinks of you is better than what you think of you. Let me say that again. What Jesus thinks of you is better than what you think of you. So think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. Kind of begs the question, so what do you, what do you think of yourself? A couple of months ago, my family and I traveled to the Grand Canyon. Now it was amazing. What we were warned of but couldn't really comprehend was the line of traffic backed up waiting to get into the park entrance. We waited about an hour in traffic as it inched its way forward toward the ultimate goal, seeing the Grand Canyon. It was painful, like impatience began to flare up, frustration, like how much more time am I going to have to waste, right? In those moments in traffic, and we've all been there, sometimes you just feel doomed as if there's no end in sight. You'll be sitting there forever. On the other hand, we experienced a very different feeling on the day we exited the park. As we were leaving, we saw the line of cars backed up to enter the park. Only this time, it was like three to four times as long as it was when we were coming in. From the other perspective, we were relieved and felt freedom as we were moving toward our destination much more quickly. And we were glad that we weren't one of those poor saps stuck in that hours long line of traffic. So Jesus continues to speak, both to those who felt that there was no end in sight to their predicament and to, do, to those who, who thought themselves pretty secure in their better off than those people position. In verse 21, he says this, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. He says, you, you think murders are bad? If you have anger or hatred in your heart towards someone, you're just as guilty as a murderer. He goes on in verse 27, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus says, adultery is bad, but so is porn, lustful glances, any sexual activity outside the marriage relationship. So this image of Jesus continues to be painted for us and he continues and goes on in verse 43. He says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And he just continues to go on on this sermon on this hillside. He says, don't, don't judge others. 
uh, store up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. He says to, to pray with continual dependence upon God. And then famously, do to others what you would have them do to you. So then you get near to the end of this sermon and your head is about to explode. And then Jesus offers this. He says, the highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. See, unlike my assessment of our Grand Canyon traffic, it doesn't matter which side of the road you're on, you find yourself pretty bad off. And how does that leave you feeling? Not good. Like, I don't want to cozy up to Jesus after I hear that sermon. And neither did the crowd who first heard it. Matthew doesn't tell us that anyone after Jesus finished ran forward ready to get baptized. No one stood up and started singing like a closing song. No one shouted encore. We want to hear more. We're told that Jesus, we're not even told that Jesus gained even one more follower after this sermon. He came across as a rebel, not a religious leader. So Matthew tells us that the people were amazed at his teaching. That's in Matthew 7, 28. The Greek word he uses isn't the word for just awe or wonder, but instead the word is explosanto. Literally, they were struck out or overwhelmed. It suggests a strong and sudden sense of being astounded. Guys, these people were offended by what he said. Jesus wasn't this guy sitting on a hillside telling people just to be nicer to each other and more loving to their neighbors. If he had said that, no one would have been astounded. Nobody would be offended by that. They all would have just nodded their head in relative comfort, figuring that they were close enough to those standards, or at least they weren't terribly far off. But that's not what happened. They were strongly astounded, Matthew tells us. This group was offended. And they were so because no matter if you were the guy who had grown up in like a faithful religious Jewish household all of your life, or maybe you were the lady who worked hard at outward appearances and and, and keeping all of your stuff neatly in order so that other people could see it, or if you were the young man which had a secret habit, which just took you a few steps down a darker path, like it didn't matter who you were, everyone was equally guilty. And yet, mysteriously, what Jesus thinks of you is better than what you think of you. So, what do you think of yourself? I want to do a a quick exercise here. We're going to measure where you think you are when it comes to faith. When it comes to just your obedience and your relationship to Jesus, you're going to measure where you are. So, I want you to consider this chart that you're going to see here as I explain uh, what these things mean. So like a one would be that you don't really believe in Jesus is the son of God. Okay, so there's your one. In the next couple, you might say that you generally feel good about being good or or, or having some faith. Like if you're a five right in the middle, you're feeling you're good. You at least have an acceptable amount of faith in your life. And after that, you feel that maybe you're you're a bit better off than many people when it comes to to living out your, your religious beliefs. Now, if you're a 10, you're not saying you're perfect, but you're well-versed in spiritual habits and you think you know Jesus pretty well. Now, most, but not all, but most of us would say we're probably at a four or five, right? Like I'm generally good or good when it comes to, to living out the Christian life. There are some who admit that maybe you're at a one or a two and that's okay. Now, I'm just really glad you're investigating Jesus with us today. Others, probably just to ourselves, we might say that we're a seven or even a nine, like we're coming out of the Grand Canyon, looking at the line of traffic coming in and thinking, well, at least I'm not one of those people. The real picture of Jesus we get from the men who knew him best and and write narratives of his life in the Bible is a Jesus who was constantly, consistently offending those who thought they were close enough to God's standards. What Jesus was proposing that day on that hillside was a rebellion. And it wasn't a rebellion against an institution or a government, but it was a rebellion against a 
a, a, against a religion, against fake security, a rebellion against false assumptions about life with God. Jesus was an outlaw and he was leading a rebellion unlike anybody had ever seen. But why would he do that? Like Jesus should have known better, right? And he did and he does. And when we are offended, do you know what offense really is? I, offense challenges us to take a look at what we hold to be true and measure it against what else could be true instead. So offense shakes us up. It causes unease. It messes with our hearts and our minds. And it forces us to confront what's fake in our lives and aim our trust at what is true. And if I'm going to follow someone who claims to know the path to a life that is best and true for me, I don't know about you, but I don't want to settle for a God who placates me with cozy vibes and leaves me to figure out my course through guesswork and half-truths. So, Jesus' words and generations of religious tradition and cozy faith culture. God is now on the scene, walking with his creation, his sons and daughters, and he loves us too much to allow us to settle for half-truths and false narratives about how he sees us. What Jesus thinks of you is better than what you think of you. So here's what the real Jesus says to us. On the sermon on the hillside that day, he says, depend on God, not on your rules, not on your values, not on your religion, not even on your goodness. The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law had blown God's original law out into 613 rules, 248 commands, and 365 prohibitions. They even bolstered all of those with, with other rules, 1,521 additional requirements just to make sure the Jewish people were doing everything well. People were steeped in a tradition that reminded them that between them and God was a long list of do's and don'ts. And they were subsequently reminded that they would never measure up. People had set their hearts to work tirelessly toward a certain level of religiosity that they felt was enough, just enough for them. And, and hopefully it was just mostly acceptable to God. And you know this because many of us grow up in that and we're practicing it now. Maybe you had religion as a set of rules or a set of holidays or a set of family gatherings in your life. Sure, the church may have taught you one thing or your grandparents may have believed a certain way, but you're much more informed now, much more modern and progressive in your beliefs and behaviors. Maybe you get comfortable at a certain place in a faith journey, like, well, I give or, or I attend or I serve or I believe. But then there's the rebel Jesus who just blows it all up. He sets the bar of religious perfection so high that no one could come out on the scale at a four or a five even, let alone an eight or nine. Like my level of imperfection, however I view it, falls way short of what is acceptable to God. You can't do it. Those who attend or serve or give or believe, it's not even enough. You're not doing enough. Now imagine if you fall into the category of people who don't even do those things regularly. The, the famous Russian author and philosopher, Leo Tolstoy, he said this, a test of observance of Christ's teachings is our consciousness of a failure to attain to the ideal perfection. The degree to which we draw near this perfection cannot be seen. All we can see is the extent of our deviation. The real Jesus paints a picture of your spiritual landscape and mine, and it's a dark and barren one. So Jesus is painting the picture of the biggest problem we have in our lives. It's our sin. It puts us too distant from God in order for us to experience full and lasting life. Now that's the problem. Now, the problem with the problem is that many of us, no, no matter our background with faith, we don't believe that. We don't believe it. And our lives reflect that we don't believe it. Our spiritual practices and the fruit we exhibit from our faith, 
show that we don't believe it. But it is our problem just the same. And the real Jesus, another thing that he says to us, and he said on the hillside that day, is to build your foundation on Jesus. Depend on God and build your foundation on Jesus. Jesus then, as his audience has been hit with this tidal wave of offense and astonishment, he offers this. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise up and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. See, Jesus is inviting us to a rebellion against the rules and ideals, which we cannot live up to anyway. A rebellion for us to build a foundation in our inner lives, to be transformed by something from outside of us. That foundation is putting our trust and obedience in Jesus. Paul, he captures it really well in his letter to the Christians in Rome. He says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. That's in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. God is crazy in love with you. Jesus died for us so that we didn't have to face death ourselves. And, and that's what we deserve. See, Jesus doesn't give us a list of religious rules on the mountainside that day. It's the character of God. That was the sermon on the hillside. That's what it was all about. So why do our actions toward others matter? Because God has acted with such like love and grace toward us. Why should we resist harsh words and, and hateful things toward others? Because God has been so merciful and treats us with such gentleness. Like, why should we be faithful to our spouse? Because God is relentlessly faithful toward us. Well, why should we love our enemies? Because we were once enemies of God and he died for us. Why are we to be overly generous? Because God is crazy generous to us. What Jesus thinks of you is so much better than what you think of you. Jesus invites us down a path to put the character of God and not our own character as the foundation of our trust and to walk obediently with him. So here's what I wanna challenge you to do this week. When was the last time you found yourself offended by Jesus? What is one thing you believe or way that you behave that doesn't line up with Jesus' words? Will you lean into Jesus in that thing this week, this week and release it to him? If you have never made the decision to follow Jesus, I just want to invite you to surrender to baptism, to put your faith in him and give your life over to Jesus and let his grace wash over you so that you can find rest and how the real Jesus really sees you. And if you want someone to talk to you about a decision that you make today, I want you to email me at nhinkle at vwocc.com because the way that Jesus sees you is so much better than the way that you see you.